Today we're going to finish up our talk on Sanhedrin. If I can do it in 40, I can do it in 40 minutes. Do you believe in me? I believe in me. All right, we're going to finish up our talk on uh, Sanhedrin and just a little recap as to why we are talking about this because uh, we are uh, going to be talking in the, in the coming weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. We're going to begin talking about uh, halakha, about observance. We talk about uh, we're Torah observant, we're Torah pursuant, we follow the Torah, we this and that, um, and we're going to get down to brass tacks about what it actually looks like what it means, what are the actual things that we, uh, that we do or are prescribed to do. And those things, the how that we live out the Torah, are not necessarily all found in the Torah. You'll understand that statement, hopefully. For instance, we use Shabbat because it's easy. There are maybe five laws in the Torah surrounding Shabbat, depending on how you count them. Um, but you start to try to keep Shabbat for two weeks, three weeks, you're going to have questions that the scripture doesn't address. What do I do about this? What do I do about that? What does this mean? What does that mean? And so, thankfully, Baruch Hashem, we have this, these humongous libraries of writings from the Jewish people from antiquity on that have uh, explained to us how they have worked out the walking and filling in the gray areas of the Torah. They are the authority. And we've talked about in our Sanhedrin messages the last few weeks, we've talked about the authority of the sages, the judges, the Sanhedrin, etc., etc. Now, this lesson has gotten more pushback than any one I've done in this whole series. And I figured it would, and I'm kind of glad it did because it's ruffling some feathers, and that's good because I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't care what you decide to do. Literally, look at me in my eyes, look at me in my face. I could not care less what you decide to do. You want to do Passover in December? Knock your socks off. It's a spring festival. But whatever. I don't care. If that's the calendar you want to follow, do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But for OAM and those attached to us, we at least, even in this group, I don't care. If some of you guys want to do, wait and do Passover in June, okay, cool because that's the calendar you think is right wonderful but at least want us to know right i want us to know the world of halakha one of the uh, arguments that i had seen before but I, i've seen floating around again is that well there was no sanhedrin mentioned in the tanakh and that is true the sanhedrin is not mentioned in the tanakh um the argument is, well, you have these elders that Moses chose, these 70 elders, um, but how do you make the jump between them and the Sanhedrin? Because the Sanhedrin's never mentioned. Well, we're going to go through that today, but just a little note, if, if you think a little bit further than your nose, um, the word Sanhedrin, if you read the Wikipedia article on Sanhedrin, the word Sanhedrin is not Hebrew. <gasps> Gasp. The word Sanhedrin is what? Greek. Sanhedrion. Okay. Now, when do the Greeks show up in Scripture? Oh, they don't. In the New Testament. They don't show up in Scripture. In history, when do the Greeks show up? Between the Testaments. Hence, we celebrate Hanukkah, right? So maybe one of the reasons why the Sanhedrin, the word Sanhedrin is not mentioned in the Tanakh is because it's a Greek loan word that didn't even exist when the Tanakh was written. See? All right. So um, we're going to talk about the formation of the Sanhedrin and kind of its, uh, we're going to talk about a couple things. First, we're going to do kind of how the lineage goes, and we're going to read from Pirkei Avot. So if you have your Sidor, uh, then you can turn to page 641, I believe it is, and get ready for that. If you don't, just listen along. It won't be long. It's, it's, uh, it'll be easy enough just to listen along. Uh, and then we're going to read uh, about the makeup of the Sanhedrin and how it's compiled, because I want to teach you some really important things from how um, uh, just a really kind of 
introductory level into how the Jewish people read the Torah. Uh, and I think it'll be really interesting. And then we'll talk lastly about some of the things that the Sanhedrin was, um, was responsible for, okay? So uh, here we go. So in Joshua 1, 7, it says, you must be very strong and resolute to have faithfully observe all the teaching that my service Mo- servant Moshe enjoined upon you. Do not deviate from it to the left or from the left or the right that you may be successful wherever you go. So again, Joshua, Yehoshua is Moshe's disciple from a young age. And the only thing that Moshe, uh, Moshe didn't only teach him what we have as the written Torah today. That would be foolish to think that that would be the only thing Moshe would have taught Joshua. So in 1.7, the, uh, the encouragement to Joshua is all the teaching of Moshe, right? So uh, we have that... Uh, we have this, this passing on from Moshe to Joshua, the authority and the teaching of the Torah. Okay, this lineage is important. So go to page 640 if you have your Siddur, if you have your, uh, your Koran Siddur. They have like two good students in here that are bringing this Siddur to every, uh, every service. So you never know when you're going to need it, so pack it along with you. All right, uh, page 640. This is uh, Pirkei Avot. If you have uh, your phone and you have service in here, you can look on your Safari app and you can pull up Pirkei Avot. Uh, you'll find it there in the, uh, in the Mishnah section. And uh, they have put it generously for um, us here. So first of all, um, the introductory uh, verse that they have here, or or a quote that they have here, um, comes from the tractate uh, Sanhedrin in the Talmud, 90a. um, And it says, All Israel have a share in the world to come. As it is said, Your people are all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. They are a shoot of my own planning, a work of of my own hands that I may be glorified. By the way, just a little point of education. You see that if you're reading the Siddur, it says Sanhedrin 90A. So if you wanted to go and find Sanhedrin, because it's one of my pet peeves, people say all the time, well, the Talmud says, or usually the Talmud says, and then they quote this part of the Talmud that they've, they've never read themselves. Don't worry, they haven't read it. Um, but the, the pet peeve is that they never tell you where you can go read it. They just tell you what it means. But they, because you see, they don't respect us enough for us to be able to think our own thoughts and determine our own outcomes. And so I don't want to do that. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to be educated. So it says Sanhedrin 90A. So you go to the Safari app, which is a beautiful free resource. You go to the Safari app you know it is the Babylonian Talmud because it has 90 A. There's a letter behind the A. That's how you know it's Babylonian Talmud. So you go to Safaria, you go to Babylonian Talmud, and then you look up Sanhedrin 90 A, and there you go. You can read it for yourself. So this is from Pirkei Avot. It says, Moshe received the Torah at Sinai and handed it on to Joshua. Everybody good so far? Joshua to the elders the elders to the prophets, the prophets handed it on to the men of the great assembly. They, the men of the great assembly, said three things. Be careful in judgment, raise up many disciples, and make a fence for the Torah. So, really quickly, Joshua to the elders. Who are the elders? Well, the elders are those that Moshe had chosen in the wilderness by the uh, encouragement of Jethro, some of them, as they die, they are replaced with new elders. So Joshua takes on the duty of educating these newer elders and continuing to cultivate what Moses had taught, which we read from Joshua 1.7, okay? The elders, it says, they passed it on to, they handed it on to the prophets. Now, we think of prophets many times in our world today as these kind of renegade, uh, you know, ragamuffin kind of one-off kind of people that uh, they have this weird special gift where they just get zapped by the spirit and they just start ah, they go in a trance and they just start spouting words right as God gives it they they spit it out and that may be some of how prophecy works um, but what we know from history is that there are schools of the prophets for example Isaiah Isaiah was part of and maybe have had his own school where they taught prophecy 
Now, this is not like the modern day Bethel school of prophecy where you put everybody in a dark room and you play music and you whip them up into a lather and then they just start babbling and doing whatever happens. I don't know, it's creepy, it wears me out, so I don't even pay attention to it, to be honest with you. But these, these ancient schools of prophecy were what we would might call non-spiritual. The prophets were taught the word of God. They were taught the tradition from Moses. So they have a, a base in the Torah, in the teaching of Moshe. But they were, but prophets were not only, they only didn't, didn't only speak to the spiritual things, they only spoke, they also spoke to what? Political. They also were a mouthpiece of God to the kings and to the priests and to the nation politically. So they had to be scholars in the word, in the Torah, in the tradition. But they also had to be very well versed in politics in diplomacy and so the the prophets would not so much as be tuned in to some kind of voice from heaven as it were as they would be watchers of the times and they could and would predict and they also have the tradition of deuteronomy 28 which is very simple it says hey if you do what i told you to blessings will come if you don't do what I told you to, you know, the head only and not below the, t you know, that, the, the above only, head not the tail is good preaching scriptures we love. But they said, if you don't do it, then these, all these bad things are gonna happen to you. The worst being exile, right? So the prophets have a pretty good foundation to work from. If you notice, what we have in Ezekiel, and we have in Isaiah, and we talk about prophetic, uh, the prophetic biblical prophets, they all say kind of sort of the same thing in a lot of ways. Like, hey, you guys are really not doing well. If you don't shape up, there's gonna be famine. And if you don't do that, there's gonna be disease. And if you don't do that, finally God's gonna kick you out of the land. But don't worry, God's gonna bring you back because that is all Deuteronomy 28. That is, all, that is the template for biblical prophecy. And a lot of what biblical prophets do is they watch the times. They watch empires move. They watch kings and princesses and all, queens and all these things. They watch this stuff move and they take it to God and there's this, this relationship. Prophecy is not probably like what we think it is in a lot of our modern circles, okay? So the elders pass on the teaching of Moses. That's what we're talking about to and the Torah to the elders, right? And then it says the elders... Uh, the prophets rather prophets handed on to the men of the great assembly now who is the who are the men of the great assembly the men of the great assembly are a, a group of men who were uh, active and giving judgments and giving direction to Israel uh, after the Babylonian exile okay the men of the great assembly this is the Ezra Nehemiah time frame these men are incredibly important because Israel is coming back from exile they are tattered they are worn they don't know who they are they have no identity they're doubting their place and covenant with God they are have just been through a chaotic and catastrophic time in their own history and so these men of the great assembly together with people like Ezra and Nehemiah work to teach the people how to begin being the people of the covenant again okay and to be able to judge now in this new era post-exile how we should live in order not to go back to exile again one of the biggest questions post-exile was how did we get here and how do we not ever come back here again right and so what do you need to do that? You don't just need Ezra and Nehemiah. You don't just need a teacher. You need a council who can start to kind of weed through these things and, understand, and teach and make judgment. Part two of Pirkei Avot, it says, Simon the Just, we will call him Shimon Hazadik. Shimon Hazadik was one of the last survivors of the men of the great assembly. He used to say, on three things the world stands, the Torah, divine worship which is interpreted to mean temple worship and acts of loving kindness so i love that the that pure kivot gives you these kind of the summation of their lives i think that's really cool so on three things the torah stands i, I want to take time on all these but i won't um because i, I want to get to some other stuff all right next it says um and 
Tentigonos, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, of Soho received the Torah tradition from Shimon Hasadik. He used to say, do not be like servants who serve their master on condition of receiving a reward, but be like servants who serve their master not on condition of receiving a reward and let the fear of heaven be upon you. That sounds really like Yeshua-y to me. Don't serve God because you're going to get something. Serve God because that's who you are. See, the beautiful thing when you start to read the Mishnah and you start to read the ancient writings is you realize how much Yeshua and his message are a product of his world that was already established. Yeshua doesn't say anything new. Next. Uh, Yose ben Yoezer of Zereda and Yose ben Yohanan of Jerusalem received the tradition from them. Now you see we have two people listed. These are what we call Zugot. Zugot are pairs of leaders of the Sanhedrin. They are a president or Nasi and a vice president or Av Beit Din, father of the house of judgment. They're called the Zugot. They're pairs. From this point on, there will be a list of pairs all the way through till after Yeshua is, is, uh, has left. And so it says, they used to say, let your house, I love this, let your house be a meeting place for sages. Sit in the dust at their feet and with thirst, drink in their words. I love this because we live in a time where we are so critical of, of wisdom <clears throat> of scholarship, of academia, of old knowledge. We don't want old knowledge. We don't sit around and listen to our grandparents anymore talk about how they used to do things in the old days before there was technology. And we have lost a connection to that kind of wisdom and that kind of living. Going on, Yosei ben Yochanan of Jerusalem used to say, let your house be wide open. Let the poor join the members of your household and do not gossip inordinately with women. This was said about one's own wife. <laughs> All the more so does it apply to another man's wife. You see, they're not being misogynistic. I think that's pretty good, that's pretty good advice. Hence the sages say, a man who talks too much with a woman brings trouble on himself, neglects the study of Torah, and in the end will inherit Gehenna. You're going to hell because you talk to women too much. <laughs> Yehoshua ben uh, per, uh, uh, Perahia, the Natai, uh, the Arbalite, received the tradition from them. Yehoshua ben Perahia uh, used to say, get yourself a teacher, acquire a companion, and give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Isn't this just good stuff? It's just good stuff to live by, right? And again, nothing that is in contradiction so far with what we know about the New Testament with Yeshua himself. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> you can talk to women. You just can't do it too. You guys just got to be careful. Got to be careful. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Next, Natai the Arbalite used to say, keep far from a bad neighbor and do not associate with a bad person and do not despair of divine retribution. <laughs> do not despair of divine retribution. How different is that than the quote-unquote gospel that you and I know, Right? God gonna send you to hell. He's gonna send you to hell. Oh, I'm sorry. God doesn't send you to hell. You send yourself to. Anyway, number eight. Yehuda ben Tabai and Shimon ben Shatak received the tradition from them. Yehuda ben Tabai used to say, "When sitting as a judge, do not act as an advocate. When the pre and when the parties, excuse me, to a lawsuit appear before you, regard them both as guilty. But when you when they leave you, having accepted the verdict, regard them both as innocent." I think that's beautiful. Shimon ben Shatak used to say, examine the witnesses thoroughly and be careful in your words, lest through them they learn how to lie. <laughs> Shemaiah and Avtalion received the tradition from them. Shemaiah used to say, love work, hate public office, and do not become too intimate with the ruling power. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Shimon ben, uh, I'm sorry, uh, let's see. Uh, Avtalion used to say, Sages, be careful in what you say, lest you incur the penalty of exile and find yourself banished to a place of evil waters, where your disciples who follow you may drink from them and die, with the result that the name of heaven will be profaned. We just read about this in Ezekiel, right? 
Number 12, Hillel and Shammai received the tradition from them. Hillel said, now Hillel is a really important guy. Hillel is right before Yeshua's time by, you know, 30, 40 years is when Hillel is the president of the Sanhedrin. After Hillel's death, there is hardly ever a Sanhedrin where a descendant of Hillel is not in leadership. He created almost a dynasty of Sanhedrinic leadership. Hillel and his, his vice president was a guy named Shammai. Now, these two guys were both Pharisees, but they had a way different view of looking at the Torah. And they each had their own school of discipleship. Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel, and Beit Shammai, the house of Shammai. And there's some wonderful reading in the Mishnah and the Gemara about the houses of Hillel and Shammai and how they differ and how they fought. Uh, eventually, the house of Shammai would invite the house of Hillel over for a meeting, and the house of Shammai would slaughter most of the house of Hillel, most of their disciples. And so this is all, but understand, this is all inter Pharisaic stuff. Understand what I'm saying? So when Miss Jennifer read the gospel and it says the Jews, the question should be, what Jews is John talking about? Because here you have just Pharisaic leadership and you have these massive chasm in some ways between these two houses, right? So it says, Hillel and Shammai received the Torah from them. Hillel being among the disciples of Aaron. Now, it doesn't mean that he was actually a disciple of Aaron, but he, there, is, uh, there is writing about the ethics of Aaron that Hillel embodied. He said, love peace and pursue peace, loving people and drawing them close to the Torah. That sounds like Yeshua's ministry in a nutshell. Because I believe, personally, that not only was Yeshua probably a Pharisee, but if he was, he learned from the house of Hillel. He used to say, a name made great is a name destroyed. Right? Yeshua says, lift up yourself before God and he'll debase you. Right? Debase yourself before God and he'll lift you up. He goes on to say, he who does not increase his knowledge loses it. He who does not study deserves to die. And he who makes worldly use of the crown, and some translations say of the Torah, passes away. Beautiful words. He used to say, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? And if I am only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? In Jewish circles, you'll hear this, or outside of Jewish, you'll hear this phrase a lot. If not now, when? This comes from Hillel. Shammai used to say, now Shammai's not all bad, he's got some good stuff to say. He used to say, make your Torah study a fixed habit. Say little and do much and greet everyone cheerfully. Rabbi Gam, uh, Rabban Galam, Gamliel, when you see the term Rabban with an N on it, that indicates president of the Sanhedrin. So he comes after Hillel. Rabban Gamliel used to say, get yourself a teacher, avoid doubt, and do not make a habit of giving tithes by guessing. 10% to the penny. Shimon, his son, used to say, all of my life I grew up around, around sages, and I found that nothing is better for a person than silence. Not learning, but doing is the main thing, and one who talks too much causes sin. Gosh, this is just such good stuff. Would it be that our children, one of the things that they would learn from us is that there is nothing more precious than silence. In a world full of talkers, in a world where everybody knows everything, in a world full of knowledge, that quietness would be a treasure. Rabban Shimon, uh, Shimon ben Gamliel used to say, on three things does the Torah, uh, I'm sorry, does the world stand? On truth, justice, and peace. As it is said, this is Zechariah 8, administer truth and the judgment of peace in your gates. Rabbi uh, Hanania ben Akasha, excuse me, said, the Holy One, blessed be he, wanted to confer merit on Israel. This is why he gave them a copious Torah and many commandments, as it is said in Isaiah 42, it pleased Hashem for the sake of Israel's righteousness to make the Torah great and glorious. 
And then it goes on for uh, another couple of chapters in Pirkei Avot. Wonderful stuff. Go read it. If you don't have this Siddur, it's in every Siddur, but you can read it from there. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff. So we, can, we, are given, we are given the lineage of the tradition of Moses. Okay, I want you to understand this because it's so very important. Were there corruptions along the way? Of course. But what this is not is this is not the game of telephone that you and I played as kids. You remember you put 20 people around in a circle or 10 or whatever it was and you said, Billy and Susie went to the store and you passed it on and by the time it came back, it was, you know, Billy's in a convict in prison and Susie's, you know, on whatever, I don't know. It got to be something else, you know, ridiculous. We, we, I've heard that illustration used to talk about this because this is an oral tradition that is passed down because the Torah isn't written until after the Babylonian exile. But this is not, you see the people that we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who were scholars, who were very intelligent, and more than that, they had a, a, a heart for God and a heart for the word and a heart for Israel. These are not just everyday people who can't be trusted. And so while there were some corruption and some incongruencies, that is going to happen, okay? So the word Sanhedrin, I said it comes from the Greek Sanhedrion, which means sitting together or council or assembly. So there, were, uh, there, are two, um, there are two uses or two courts in Israel called Sanhedrin, okay? There, are, uh, there is a lesser Sanhedrin also called um, uh, Sanhedrin, uh, Hakatan, Hakatana, Sanhedrin Hakatana. If you think, um, if you wear a talit with an undershirt, you wear a talit katan. The talit that we hold up over the kids is called a talit hagadol. Gadol, great, big talit, talit katan, small talit. So you have a 23 member court, which is a, uh, a Sanhedrin Hakatana. Then you have the great Sanhedrin, which is Sanhedrin Hagedola, the large, great Sanhedrin, okay? So the, the smaller one has 23 judges, and the larger one has 71 judges. Now, this is super, super cool, and so I want to read this. This is from Mishnah Sanhedrin. Um, so if you have the Safaria app, you can read this, or you can just listen to it. Uh, this is from Mishnah Sanhedrin. And you might wonder, who came up with the numbers 23 and 71? Why are there 23 members on one and 71 on another one? Who, who determined that? This is super cool, okay? So I'm going to walk around a little bit because I'm getting nervous standing. I'm, I'm getting tired of just standing up there. All right, so it says, with regard to the number of judges. By the way, if you want to know all about the Sanhedrin, go to Safaria and look up Mishnah Sanhedrin and there's all these chapters you can read about what they did and how they did it then you can go to the Babylonian Talmud and you can read all the discussion about the Mishnah you just read see same thing for the red heifer there is a Mishnah uh, a tractate in the Mishnah called Para. you can go there and read all about it see Isn't, it's great so it says with regard to the number of judges in the different courts the Mishnah presents a halakhic midrash the great Sanhedrin was composed of 71 judges, and a lesser Sanhedrin was composed of 23. From where is it derived that a gr the great Sanhedrin was composed of 71 judges? See, they're asking the question, how do we get that number? As it is stated in Numbers 11, gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel. So that's Hashem's command to Moshe, gather 70 men, right? whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them into the tent of meeting and they shall stand there with you. So we have that, that's 70. It says, and together with Moses at the head of this body, there are a total of 71. See, 71. Now, the president is not necessarily a member of the Sanhedrin because Moses was not necessarily a member of that. He was over and above that. It says, Rabbi Yehuda says, Moses indeed was at the head of the body, but he is not counted as a part of the group. Consequently, a future great Sanhedrin modeled after these elders is to be composed of 70 judges. And where from it is it derived that a lesser Sanhedrin is composed of 23 judges? Y'all, this 
tripped me out the first time I read it because this is how this is how Jewish people read the read the Torah right so how where do we get 2300 from a lesser Sanhedrin as it is stated in Numbers 34 this is what it says Numbers 34 24 and 25 says and the congregation shall judge between the assailant and the avenger and the congregation shall save the manslayer from the hands of the avenger. This is talking about the cities of refuge in that section, right? So it mentions the congregation. So what should your question be? How many is a congregation, right? Well, what is, what is, it says, so, therefore, there must be a congregation which consists of at least 10 judges that judges the accused and attempts to convict him, Right? And there must be a congregation also consisting of at least 10 judges which attempts to save the accused by finding him innocent. Everybody with me so far? So you have to have 10 trying to convict and 10 trying to, to uh, release, right? We still don't know how many a congregation is, but it says, together there are 20 judges here. Before proceeding to derive the requirement for the final three judges, the Mishnah clarifies. And from where is it derived that a congregation consists of at least 10 men? As it is stated concerning the spies. You remember the spies? How many spies were there? 12 altogether, right? As it as is concerning the spies, Numbers 14, 27 says... How long shall I bear this evil congregation that keep complaining about me? So check this out. This is Jewish math. How many spies were there all together? Twelve. How many were speaking evil against Hashem? Ten. The Torah calls that evil group a congregation. So how many are in a congregation? Ten. That's a congregation as defined by the Torah. Now, this is why I want us to delve into the world of Jewish understanding even deeper because you wouldn't read the Torah like that. You wouldn't get that from the Torah. If somebody asked you, uh, how much is a congregation defined by the Torah? Uh, you'd come up with all kinds of numbers, right? Also, when we, if you pray in your Siddur, you might notice it says, mentions the word minyan, minyan, which is how many men? Why? Because that's a congregation. There's certain prayers that are said only when there are a group of 10 men because that is a community. Less than 10, you're a bunch of individuals. 10 and up, you have become a congregation. This is where it comes from, right? Isn't that super cool? Oh, but it gets better. All right. So there are 12 spies excluding Joshua and Caleb who did not complain there would be 10 men who are called a congregation. Accordingly, the verses describing a congregation that attempts to convict the accused and a congregation that attempts to acquit him together add up to 20. We're good, right? And from there, and from where, excuse me, is it derived to bring three more judges to the court? I love this. From the implication of that which is stated, you shall not follow a multitude to convict. This is in Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. You shall not follow a multitude to convict or to do evil, some translations say. Um, but the evil is convicting. It says, I would derive that I may not convict the person on the basis of, uh, excuse me, of a simple majority, but I should follow the majority to exonerate. So the Torah says, don't follow a majority in order to convict. So the converse of that would be follow a majority in order to exonerate. So work harder to let people, set people free than to convict them. It says, I would derive that I may not convict uh, on the purpose of a majority. Okay, so it's, if so, why is it stated in the same verse to include after a multitude or to incline after a multitude from which it can be understood that the majority is followed in all cases? In order to resolve the apparent contradiction, it is explained. Your inclination after the majority to exonerate is not like your inclination after the majority to convict. Your inclination after the majority to exonerate 
can result in a verdict by a majority of one judge. But your inclination after the majority to convict the transgressor must be by a more decisive victory of at least two. So is everybody with me so far? So you got 20 men, 20 judges. You have somebody standing before that you're giving that they're in, on trial for something. Now, the, the, uh, the desire of the court is to find this person innocent. That's the mercy of the court. The Torah and the judges always leaned toward mercy there's some writings that say that you know in the bible it talks about if somebody does this stone them if somebody does this kill them if somebody does this blah blah blah, blah. there's rabbinic writings that say that you know nobody was like ever stoned <laughs> because the torah teaches to err on the side of mercy so you have this person that has created uh, committed a transgression and you have these 23 judges we'll get to that in a second you have these judges it takes one to find them innocent just one above the, the the split but if you want to convict them and have them stoned or exiled or whatever you have to have at least two above the majority or above the balance right so it goes on to say therefore the court must have at least 22 judges if you're going to find somebody guilty and since there is a principle that a court may not be composed of an even number of judges, as, as such a court may be unable to reach a decision, therefore they add another one to them, and there are 23 judges here. And then it goes on to say, how many men shall be eligible for a lesser Sanhedrin? So the, the great Sanhedrin, the 71 member of Sanhedrin, only met in Jerusalem. That's the only place that it is. These lesser Sanhedrin, the 23 member courts, were in bigger cities throughout Israel. So what determines what city gets a Sanhedrin and which one doesn't? It says, how many men must be in the city for it to be eligible for a lesser Sanhedrin? Rabbi Nehemia says 230 corresponding to the ministers of tens as outlined by Moses and Yitro in the wilderness. Does everybody understand where we are? Yitro told Moses, he said, get people and make them captains over how many? What, do you, what number do you start with? Tens. Not twos, not fives, not sevens. Tens is the smallest denomination that a judge in the Torah can be over a group. It's the smallest group that they can be over. And so it says that each member of the Sanhedrin is honored if they have 10 men that they can be over. And the people then are not put at a disadvantage or at a bondage because if you have one judge over three people, that gets kind of messy. And then you're back at the Moses thing where you're wearing the people and yourself out, right? So I just think that's super cool. You may not care and you might go like, okay, that's 30 minutes of my life I can't get back. But I thought it was awesome, so I wanted to share it with you and hopefully entice you to go find out some more uh, goodness and some more knowledge. So just real quick, what is the Sanhedrin? Um, what do they do and what are they over? So super quick. Um, so the Sanhedrin meets, the great Sanhedrin meets in the temple and it meets in this building here. And those of you on Wednesday night, you should know this. What is the name of this building? Beit, huh? Avtinas. Kyle wasn't even there and he knows it. Shame on you, Robin. <laughs> so sh shut up, you suck up. All right, this is Beit Avtinas, this whole big room right here, Beit Avtinas. Um, the family of Avtinas was a priestly family. They were incensors. Uh, they took care of all the incense for the temple, and so this uh, chamber was named in honor of them. The, uh, the uh, Great Sanhedrin met in this room right here, in what's called the Hall of Hewn Stone, or in Hebrew, the what? Lishkat Hagazit. Very good. The Lishkat Hagazit, uh, they met in a semicircle of like bleachers kind of things, a semicircle where they could all see one another, um, and that's where they did their 
uh, their, made their judgments, heard their cases, uh, did their disputes and all those kinds of things. So um, the Sabbath, uh, they did not meet on the Sabbath and feast days, but they met in a, a different place. Um, and the, according to the Talmud, the Great Bay Din had the following functions. It exercised uh, either as a whole body or as committees. It had supervision over the temple service. So they actually supervised the Kohanim, the temple service. Um, and this, this quote says, which was required to be conducted in conformity with the Torah, obviously, and according to Pharisaic interpretation. Now, I love this. The temple service during the time of uh, the, the great Sanhedrin, which is just you know after the Maccabees towards the first century, the temple service had to be done in order, in, in accordance with the Torah and Pharisaic interpretation. Why is that? Why is that? Why is it Pharisaic interpretation? Because who's the president of the Sanhedrin? Hillel is one of them, right? He is a what? Pharisee. So as long as it doesn't violate the Torah, it's Pharisaic tradition. I'm in charge. I, we get to say how things are done, right? I love that. All right. So the, the Sanhedrin decided which priests uh, should perform the temple service each day. So there's, uh, the, the priests would come in um, to the Hall of Hewn Stone. They would present themselves to the Sanhedrin, certify that they were clean and fit for service. And then they would uh, put on their priestly garments. They would wash their hands and feet in the brazen laver. And... Um, and then they would have a big feast for them where they would, they would bless God for, being, uh, for his fidelity to the sons of Aaron, promise of Aaron. Um, it supervised ritual acts such as the Day of Atonement that was under the purview of the Great Sanhedrin. Uh, and it was also in charge of the burning of the red heifer and preparation of the water of purification. Uh, when the body of a murdered person was found, the Sanhedrin was in charge of finding the nearest town so that that town could bring an offering of atonement for the dead body. So you're out in the desert, you're going on a journey, whatever, you find a dead body. There's a, supposed to be an offering that, that is made to atone for that death. Now, so you have to find a community that can bring that offering. Because just like life permeates, so does death. And making an offering atones for that uh, we were talking about this Wednesday night, and I think Miss Becky said, uh, across from around our house, around our, where we live, we've had a couple of deaths. And the houses are still there, and you, it's, still just like a, it's still just like a sense of something's not right. And so th the ancients dealt with it uh, in the ways of offerings. And so the great uh, Sanhedrin also decided as to the tithes and how the tithes were done. Uh, it also sat in judgment on women suspected of adultery and sentenced them to drink the bitter water, if appropriate. Uh, let me say something real quick. I know I'm going long, excuse me. But um, this is called the Sota, the laws of Sota, the woman accused of adultery. This is, see, if you know Sanhedrin, then you read the story of Yeshua and the woman caught in the act of adultery, and you go well, like, this is just all whack right it's the whole thing is all but you know how ridiculous it is on its face so many people ask well like where is the man in all of this well the Sanhedrin when the Sanhedrin judges the Sota the woman uh, accused of adultery the woman comes and her husband comes because he's the accuser he has to stand before the court and make his case so the man has to be there who else is there the men, man or men who she is accused of being with because they have to defend and they have to have witnesses for their end, right? This, the Torah makes, see, this is what's important. The Torah makes it sound, in the laws of Sota, makes it sound like, hey, this jealous man, he believes his wife's cheating on him. So what does he do? He grabs her by the hair. It doesn't say that, but that's, he grabs her by the hair and he drags her before the elders and he throws her down in the dirt and he kicks dust on her and he spits in her face and he says, she's guilty of adultery. And so the judges say, 
will make her drink this water. And if her belly blows up, whatever that means, I think I know what it means, then she's guilty. How many of you ever seen Monty Python in Search for the Holy Grail? Have you ever seen it? She's a witch, right? Because wood floats, and so witches are made out of wood, right? That's the same kind of way that we read about the Sota in the Torah. This is why it's so important to understand the halakha and, the, and the, the read the oral Torah because it fills in all these gaps. That's ridiculous. That's like magic. What happens is the man brings the woman after probably much intervention, intercession, counseling, all this other kind of stuff. Yes, they did counseling in the ancient world. When it comes to a point of no, not being able to work it out anymore, they come before the judges and the man says his case and the woman gives her case they have witnesses it's a trial guys it's a whole blown out thing that might last days maybe weeks and then if she is found guilty after all of the trial now remember the, to the Torah and the court errs on the side of mercy remember so how many women actually drank the bitter waters we don't know but I would guess less than maybe what we think. You know, something that this should teach us is that in our world today and in our churches today, do we err on the side of mercy or on the side of judgment? Right? We have this like ready, fire, aim kind of attitude where if we just think somebody's not doing it the way or not doing the things they should be doing, we want to condemn them. We, just, we make judgments without knowing anything. But the Torah tells us to err on the side of mercy, right? It's, it's easier to believe the best about somebody than to convict them of the worst. Yes, the, the woman still has a choice even to, whether to show up or not. Whether they're like, you're crazy. Whatever. <laughs> yes, because the desire is to make the marriage work. Yes, thank you, Mr. Rahman. So, yes, the man will bear his that's right will bear his iniquity because the thing about the court system or in the justice system is that if i accuse you of something and and let's say the, the penalty is stoning and you're found guilty i have to throw the first stone which should make you really rethink about what you accuse people of even if they're guilty even if you're guilty and you get stoned i still have to throw the first stone what a balance of judgment but if I accuse you and you're found not guilty, then I get to be stoned, right? It's, it's a beautiful, a beautifully intricate system and compassionate as well. And so um, the Sanhedrin was also in charge of arranging the calendar and providing uh, correct copies of the Torah for the king and for the temple use. It also decided all... Uh, doubtful questions regarding to religious law and it rendered the final decision regarding the sentence of a teacher who was a false teacher um, I said this a couple weeks ago let me just say this about the calendar real quick because the Sanhedrin did have authority to, uh, to do the, the calendar the reason we have a calculated calendar is because the sighted moon calendar is dependent upon witnesses people have to come and say we saw the moon and they have to testify of what they saw. There has to be a little mini trial. It came to be that in the time of the Romans that there were rulers that were not, that they outlawed the Sanhedrin. And they said, anybody that has to do anything with the Sanhedrin will kill you. Period, full stop. So in an effort to save the lives of witnesses, which is the basis of the Torah, by the way, in an effort to save the lives of the, of the witnesses, they voted and agreed on a, on a calculated calendar so that witnesses will not have to put their lives at risk to come and cite the new moon and establish the calendar, right? So that is all about the, that's not all. <laughs> There's a lot of other good juicy stuff about the Sanhedrin, but that's all we're gonna cover. Uh, again, next week, no service. The two weeks after that, we're gonna go through the Haggadah. Uh, and, uh, and talk about this. So get your Haggadahs in. Have questions ready, if you would. Uh, also, the other book that I mentioned, uh, I will link those for you tonight after Shabbat. Uh, and so as we approach looking into more of the, or, uh, the uh, traditional Halakha, I want us to have in mind that these rules are not made up by people who don't care. 
These rules are not made up in order to try to break the Torah. These are, these are the laws. These are the laws of the commandments as it has come down uh, through the ages. All right?